Hello sportsmen, what is deer season all about anyway? Well, to some people, shooting a deer is the entire focus. A few people devote all their efforts to getting a deer with a huge rack. But the average sportsman, uh, where they go and who they go with is the most important thing about deer hunting. Now, I'm one of those hunters that values deer camp as much, if not more, than the hunt itself. Stay tuned for a look at our UP deer camp, the way it's done by a group of practical sportsmen. After two days of hunting in the Lower Peninsula, Matt Radzilowski and I packed the camper for a little change in scenery. Seven hours north on I-75 across Mackinac Bridge, west on US-2, finally winding over logging roads somewhere west of Marquette. The last hour of the trip, we saw very few trucks, very few people, very little evidence of people. Following the directions that Gary Graham gave us and using the map wasn't as easy as you might think. Logging roads seemed to branch off in every direction. We didn't see many tire tracks or many deer tracks for that matter. You didn't get us lost, did you? <laughs> no, it was a joint effort. <laughs> I'm keeping us lost. <laughs> We're, we're close. We know we're in the right county, so we got it narrowed down. I don't, you're the navigator, man. Well, there's a lot more roads than this map shows up here. <laughs> yeah, they've been, they've been busy little beavers up here, <laughs> logging away with new roads. And they don't, the signage, the signage is very poor, very poor. Lack uh, of street signs. Lack of street signs, but I tell you, it's, it's gorgeous. As long as the hills don't get too much steeper and the snow doesn't get too much deeper, because I'll have to drop it into Creeper. <laughs> but at least you've got your beeper. <laughs> hey, it's a long drive. You can get a little goofy at the end of the day when you're not exactly sure where that lake is. A little lake. Uh-huh. Uh-huh, Maddie, to your right. Over to the right there. We are home. Home sweet home. We found it. <laughs> well, this is called the Four G's Camp because all four guys' last names begin with G. Fires are burning. Now, it kind of concerns me there's just one vehicle here. Now there's two. But we are here. The Upper Peninsula of Michigan has lots of land that looks like this. Trees, beaver ponds, trout streams. Now, oh, it's beautiful country. But there aren't many people, or stores, or gas stations once you get off the main highways. The 4G's camp is truly remote. It's a 45-minute drive to civilization, and that's if the weather and the roads are good. It's also quite a hike back to the deer blinds through the swamps and canyons. So why'd you pick uh, this spot for us, hunt, Gary? Oh, because the deer have been coming in off the, through the canyon line there, and uh, we got them coming in on the bait. And I'm hoping like hell or something comes in. Huh, you guys been seeing many deer up here? Or? No, it's been scarce this year. Been real scarce. After the winters of uh, 95 and 96, you know, it just took a lot of them out. But there's some big ones around here and that's what we're hoping to see. The Upper Peninsula produces a few big bucks, but not a lot. Trophy bucks aren't really why hunters go through everything they have to go through to camp and hunt up here. Not all hunters like this kind of remoteness, aloneness, but a few hunters do. Instead of traffic sounds and airplanes overhead, you hear the streams gurgling all day long. The country can be rugged. You have to be in shape to walk it. But at the end of the day, you return to camp where it's warm and friendly and there are people inside, your buddies, guys you enjoy being with, playing cards, throwing darts. The 4Gs stayed in their mobile cabin, something we'll show you in a future program. Matt and I stayed in the truck camper. Now, for us, it didn't turn out to be trophy buck heaven. In fact, I only saw two deer during the three days we were there. But this was deer camp at its best. It was a different world, one of beauty and anticipation and wonder. The beavers work the hardest up in this country. The rest of us just enjoy what they create. The first week of deer season 
in lower Michigan it rained. Up here, it snowed, and that by itself was very cool. Okay, let's check some of the stories that affect hunters and fishermen that have been in the news recently. Uh, this past week, the Detroit Free Press ran a reminder that long gun sales, now we're talking rifles and shotguns as opposed to the shorter handguns, long gun sales require a federal okay starting Monday, November 30th. Now this federal okay was part of the 1993 Brady Bill, uh, which means that whenever a gun is sold, the gun dealer must call an 800 number that is hooked into FBI files in order to check whether or not the applicant can legally purchase a gun. Now, I know there's this attitude out there that anyone can buy a gun in America, but that's not true. <clears throat> Here's a list of people who were banned by federal law from purchasing a gun of any kind. A person convicted or under indictment for felony charges. A fugitive. A mentally ill person. A person with a dishonorable military discharge. Uh, someone who has renounced U.S. citizenship an illegal alien, an illegal drug user, a person convicted of a domestic violence misdemeanor, or anyone who is under a domestic violence restraining order. Now, these people, by federal law, cannot purchase guns. Their rights are curtailed because of an overriding concern for public safety due to their behavior or mental state. Now, on Monday's Lansing State Journal, an Associated Press story said that 85,000 gun shops were bracing for these instant telephone checks. Jim Kessler, who heads up the FBI's National Instant Check System, said the FBI hired over 500 telephone operators and that, quote, most people should get their answer within 30 seconds about whether the sale can proceed or be delayed. Well, this instant check concept has been endorsed by the NRA because on paper, at least, it would not be a big intrusion on a law-abiding person's rights. However, opening day of instant check season, uh, things didn't run that smoothly. The Detroit News reported on Tuesday that computer crashes and jammed telephone lines caused law-abiding gun buyers to wait several hours for their, quote, instant checks. Presumably, uh, these glitches will be ironed out so the instant checks will work like they're supposed to. I'm sure that we'll be revisiting this subject uh, quite a bit more in the future. Now, on Thursday, November 26th, Eric Sharp reported in the Detroit Free Press that Mitch Rompola, the hunter who claimed to have taken a new world record whitetail buck right here in Michigan, could rack up a fortune if he'd have the buck scored by Pulp and Young, the organization that officially keeps world record animals taken with bow and arrow. Now, some people have said that this rack could be worth as much as a million dollars to Mitch if it's officially scored. But Rompola said, quote, they're never going to get their hands on it. It isn't getting out of my sight. Now, Rompola has, has apparently had a running feud with Pope and Young for many years. Uh, this buck, by the way, dressed out at 263 pounds. It has a 38-inch spread, 12 antler points, and several are, are over 14 inches long. No typical buck has ever been bigger. Now, Craig Calderon, who took a record buck years ago and who is the world uh, White Tails Museum near Grass Lake offered Rompola $5,000 if he'd let the rack be examined, or at least x-rayed, to make sure it was authentic. Rompola's answer, according to Eric Sharp at the Free Press, was, I'm not going to have it x-rayed for him or anybody. I don't have to. This guy just wants to discredit me. I will not deal with him whatsoever. Well, on Saturday, uh, Eric Sharp was able to report that Mitch Rompola decided to have his big buck scored and the rack x-rayed uh, by Pope and Young. Rompola won't say where he got the buck, but he claims it came from the northern lower peninsula. Uh, this is not the last that you'll be hearing about this big buck rack in the news. Okay, did you see this Associated Press story that came out last week? It said, farmers may drop lawsuit over deer population. Now, this headline isn't exactly accurate. The Michigan Farm Bureau has been talking about suing the DNR for improperly managing the deer herd, but no lawsuit was ever filed, so there's no lawsuit to drop. The Farm Bureau is talking about dropping their threat of a suit if the DNR doesn't get deer numbers and crop damage by deer down. 
But the extremely liberal doe hunting regulations this season is apparently whacking and stacking does in record numbers. And even though this may satisfy the Farm Bureau, I'm hearing lots of concern about the DNR's policies from sportsmen. And as you might guess, there's been talk of bringing a lawsuit against the DNR for mismanaging the herd. Well, a week ago, Eric Sharp wrote another article in the Detroit Free Press where he said the DNR was pleased with their early projections on how many deer were taken during the firearm season. Now, many sportsmen ask, where does the DNR get its data? Now, I'm not going to get into that subject right now, but there is widespread skepticism as to whether or not the DNR really knows how many deer there are out there and how many deer hunters take. Now, not every state runs its deer programs like Michigan. Last September, I was fishing in Little Bay to Knock with Mark Schultz, who's a Wisconsin resident. He has a business in Michigan. He lives on the Michigan-Wisconsin border. I asked Mark how Wisconsin tracks its deer hunters and its deer. What about deer hunting and the regulations you have in Wisconsin? We don't have a back tag anymore. We used to have little teeny back tags with little teeny numbers, and they discontinued those. You guys, you do have a back tag or not? Yeah, we have back tags. They're very large and they're very bright. Um, I think I got one of them on me here. I had to buy early so I could apply for an antlerless permit, which I didn't get. But, uh, yeah, you can't miss them. You have to wear them. It's, it's a pretty steep fine if you don't. You can see them from a long ways away. Are they the same color every year? No, they're different colors every year, and your, and your bow and your rifle are different. That's, wow. your, that's your Wisconsin rifle. Look at the size rifle. of that baby. Our tags, honestly, were about this big with numbers about that big. Some eight, ten digit number. Right. I mean, preposterous to have on your back, but that baby you can see. Oh, yeah. The theory is for trespass that people can get your number? Right. Does right. it work? Uh, I think, unlike Michigan, their computer system does work. You know, and you do have to register your deer and the, the tags you, are in. You register all of your deer? Every deer. So what do you do with this? This has a, a tear-off tag here of some type. Well, you'll tear this whole bottom half off. And then on the back, that's the information you'll tag on your deer. Oh, so you'll you don't notch the side like we, what, you're supposed to cut right through just there? Just cut right through there. So it has the little line you're supposed to cut. Right. The size of it. Now, oh, including the time. Including the time. How come... PM I don't know why... PM, no, that's their punch for oh, your... that's their punch tag. Okay. For, your, for your rope. So time of kill, AM, PM, the date, the month, antlered buck or antlerless. That's what you have to do. Right. Well, that's interesting. But and you, you know, have to buy the big holders, of course, to put this on your You back. have to have the big ones. And it can be a real pain bow hunting. You're leaning against that tree and you move and the plastic is rubbing on the bark. Hmm. And how much does this cost you as a resident? I think they're $20 this year. 20 bucks? Yeah, 18 or $20. Well, that's more than we pay in Michigan. Right. Huh. But you also say the bow tag is a different color then. No, the bow tag will be a different color. So there's no confusion tagging a deer that you're using the wrong, yeah, you can't say you use accidentally the wrong tag, mm -hmm. especially with a picture of a gun or a bow. Oh, it has the gun right there. Right. Huh. Now, what about this mandatory check-in? What, what's, what's that? What's the deal there? You, you put this on the deer. And then you have to take it to a registration station. Uh, if, if you're hunting from downstate and say you get a, a hunter's choice permit, it's mm -hmm. for a certain location. If you're caught transporting that deer out of that location without a registration clip on it, you'll get a fine for an improperly tagged deer. Well, how many stations are there? I mean, There's usually two or three in a town. You know, they're gas stations or sports shops. Oh, they use just like the license dealers on Right, right. And then they'll have tags. You bring it in, they'll check your deer. Uh, they, a lot of them have scales, you can weigh it. And then they get a metal lock tag like the old Michigan mm -hmm. license used to be. And then that's clipped on the deer. Are Michigan or Wisconsin sportsmen pretty happy with that system, the check-in and all? It works. You know, I, I, I feel happier with them saying, well, we shot 800,000 deer this year. Granted, you might have a half or 1% people might not register your deer, but 99% of them will. You know. What do you think our, about our DNR's deer numbers in Michigan, about how many we kill based on bridge count and estimates? Well, I don't believe it. But that's, 
That's all I'm going to say. I can sit at the Niagara Bridge between Kingsford and Niagara and count deer going across too, I guess, and, and tell them how many were shot in the UP. Yeah. You know, so it, it, it's hard to say. But uh, with this mandatory registration, you, the, the hunters kind of like that. It, it kind of works. And, and we've had several groups in Michigan and the UP sportsmen's groups now trying to push for it. And Michigan says it doesn't work. You know, it'll, it'll never work. People won't register their deer, but yet in turn they'll say 80% of the people follow the law. Mm -hmm. Well, if you can get 80%, that's better than a guess. Yeah. You know the way I look at it. Hmm. Well, that's something. That's the. Oh yeah, you can't you can't miss that. You can't miss that one. You don't even need binoculars. In fact, at I can see yards. that right up under there with, with your picture. No, no. <laughs> as long as there's not bars behind it, we're okay. <laughs> It's interesting to hear how the state on the other side of Lake Michigan keeps track of the number of deer that hunters take. In a nutshell, they use licensed dealers as check-in stations. You bring your deer in, they put on a metal tag like we used to use in Michigan. That way, nearly every deer taken is counted, so their DNR is working with actual figures, not projections from surveys. Now, our opinion poll question this week on our website is, do you think Michigan should institute a check-in system similar to Wisconsin's, or do you think the projections and estimates from surveys are accurate enough? I mean, in other words, do you believe Michigan DNR numbers, or do you think an actual count would be worthwhile? Register your opinion on our website. Opinion poll asked about the practice of conservation officers to come onto private property without permission, without probable cause, that a crime was being committed. In other words, COs just strolling across private land as if it were public land. The question was, should there be a difference between a person's rights on public versus private land? The responses indicated that 81% said private land should have the benefit of privacy and COs should have a warrant or probable cause to trespass on private land. 19% said COs should be able to walk onto private land just as freely as they patrol public land. This subject has been and will continue to be tested in courts where the scales have been tipping in favor of private landowner rights. In our Outdoor Travel Guide section, we have a little graph here where we show the trophy fish month by month. Check that out for November, December. November, 17 trophies, December, 9. I mean, that is, that's really uh, slim pickings for trophy fish at this time of year. Partly it's because not many anglers are out there, but you know, we do have darn good fishing. Cadillac, of course they got some good deer hunting up there according to Chip, but walleye, they're catching walleye at night up to 25 inches. Lake Cadillac, a good fishery. They're getting some nice sized pike. Down here at Ludington, uh, pike up to 35 inches, Paramarquette Lake. Steelhead, they're catching limits off the pier and perch fishing has been good. Down at Whitehall, uh, steelhead, best in the White River, getting some limits of perch as well. I mean, good eating size perch. Down here, right here in the Kalamazoo River, Ben Knoll, a couple years ago. Ben does a lot of steelhead fishing. Check out what he caught. He caught, I mean, this carp is huge, 35 pounds on a Normark scale. It was 38 inches long, twice as big as any steelhead he, he planned on catching. But that's a type of fish that you can catch at this time of year. Over here at Lakeside, Lake St. Clair, they're getting some good perch fishing, 8 to 10 inches off Selfridge, a Saginaw River. In fact, I talked to Keith Lutz, as well as uh, uh, Matt talked to Mike from Frank's Great Outdoors, and Saginaw River is producing some, some good uh, walleye fishing right now, and they're catching some perch as well. Up in Oscoda, steelhead have been slow on the Osaba River, but whitefish, we're talking the, the lake whitefish, 3 to 4 pound average. Now, not, here's, a, here's a picture of a Menominee whitefish. Now they're quite a bit smaller. This is a 17 incher that Gary Brown from Manistee caught off Manistee early November last year. But uh, these Menominee whitefish are not the ones they're catching right now. We're talking about the lake whitefish, the big ones. Uh, Indian River, deer hunting has been slow because of the weather. They've been getting two to three walleye per angler. Burt Lake, Burt Lake is, is a good walleye producer year round. Steelhead limits, they're of the smaller size steelhead in the Sturgeon River. Up in the Yoop. Manuskong Bay has been slow for hunting and fishing because of the weather, warm weather, cold weather, windy weather. Marquette has been slow. Whitefish have been fair off the break wall. Gladstone, some limits of, of walleye, and look at the size of them, 8 to 10 pounders, according to Naomi at Bayshore. Uh, Ontonagon, deer hunting has been slow up in uh, the Keweenaw. 
some good deer hunting. You're getting some big bucks up there, seeing lots of grass. But take a look at this buck that was taken a year ago on opening day. Craig Varco from Fowlerville went up there in Houghton County, got this 12-pointer, 19 and a half inch spread, 11 and a half inch tines. Houghton County, he has a story to tell about that. And, uh, you know, we also have at our banquet last year, some guys talked about a big buck and they had a, uh, a squirrel a buck. You believe it? Well, we got these both the deer the same night. Uh, we were in this blind that we call the Tower of Doom, and we heard this loud noise, and we looked out there and heard these two deer were fighting. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> these two deer were fighting. Yeah, that's a squirrel of buck. I got lots of those on my property. I don't know how they started. I guess similar to the uh, jackalopes out west. And uh, a squirrel of buck. Yeah. That's a Boone and Cro I mean, that's a Chippendale record book there. A Chippendale. There you go. That's very good. Yep. Well, he's a creative, so. right. Yes, yes, he is. And you are Carl Hunt right. from Barrington. Right. Okay, and who's this character? That's uh, Jim Harrington. He's from Barrington. Too. He's from Barrington. Beautiful and, and you, town, Barrington. And you claim the uh, squirrel of buck. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It was kicking that little one's butt there, and I decided that... <laughs> Just to save embarrassment on that one, I would go ahead and take this one, and and you know. Well, good for you. It makes a, a better story. Yeah, yeah. And this one, did you get around the Barrett in there? Right, my backyard. Uh, oh. <laughs> He's got 110 acre backyard anyway. Oh, 110 yeah. acres. Yeah. Okay, well that's something else. Who, who mounted that squirrel? Uh, no, well, that's a, that's a personal question, right? <laughs> yeah, no, that is. Uh, uh, <laughs> Sometimes you can get him to admit it. <laughs> yeah. When are you expecting? Huh? When are you expecting? Oh, no. Uh, <laughs> no, you're, you're a taxidermist? Uh, no, I sir? just uh, kind of put this one uh, together. Just so, I'd had, just so I'd meet your 10-point criteria and be able to get my 15 minutes of fame. You know how that goes. Yes. <laughs> It was either this or Sally Jesse or something like that, so I figured this was closer. Like you -ness for him. <laughs> you guys. Congratulations to you. We haven't had a story like that before. Way to go, Carl. Make sure that you tune in to this station next Thursday night at 8 p.m. That's Big Buck Night, an hour and a half special here on public television. We show you bucks from all over the state. Until then, get independent by taking to the road with an RV. There's no better way to enjoy Michigan's great outdoors. See you next week. It's warm and friendly, and there are people inside, your buddies, guys you enjoy being with, playing cards, throwing darts, the four G's stayed in their mobile cabin, something we'll show you in a future program. Matt and I stayed in the truck camper. Now, for us, it didn't turn out to be trophy buck heaven. In fact, I only saw two deer during the three days we were there. But this was deer camp at its best. It was a different world, one of beauty and anticipation and wonder. The beavers work the hardest up in this country, the rest of us just enjoy what they create. The first week of deer season in lower Michigan, it rained. Up here, it snowed, and that by itself was very cool.